Good evening, everyone. Hello. Hi. It's only 6 o'clock, 6.30. Um, so I'm going to keep my comments very brief, but I first wanted to thank the Tenement Museum for hosting this wonderful event. The first time I came here was when I was an undergraduate student. Um, I studied anthropology, so somehow I, you know, was sort of doing all these museum and site visits, and it's just so wonderful now to, to be here and to, to tell Caribbean stories um, in such a monumental institution in New York that's really about being an immigrant. Um, and that's really what most of my undergraduate work um, was about. It was about being that so, sort of like whole quest and search for identity. So, and it's really brought me full circle. So this is really a very meaningful and powerful evening. So thank you so much to Emily and, and to Laura and to everyone who helped make this happen. Um, and also to, to Jamani for, for making time in his schedule to, for, to be here. Um, so Caribbean was conceptualized in 1999, as I mentioned, when I was an undergraduate student um, in Brooklyn. Um, so we went to school together, Jamani and I. Um, we didn't know each other in school, in full disclaimer, like we kind of saw each other, but I studied anthropology and, and Caribbean studies, and um, I was born in Flatbush um, to two, fam two parents who were both from Trinidad, um, and so, you know, as I was going through my, my uh, sort of work in school, you know, I had this, you know, I was really searching for who I was and, and sort of like what it meant to be Caribbean um, and a first generation Caribbean, especially when you're, you know, we're going back and forth. I, I spent many summers going to Trinidad and then as a, an undergraduate student, I started to travel a lot in the region um, and, you know, wanting to be Trinidadian and people were like, no, you're not. Um, and then you're sort of like here and you're not quite American. So, you know, that's how this whole concept of Caribbean came about. So I conceptualized it when I was in college. And in 2000, we started doing, I'm sorry, 2010, excuse me, we started doing our first public program. Um, and so our mission is to illuminate the Caribbean experience in greater New York City and around the world. We've done a few international programs, one in Poland, um, one in the south of France, and then we've also um, been invited to do a program in, in Barbados. Um, so today, um, Caribbean has really evolved and, and grown quite a bit. Um, so we're synonymous in New York City with Caribbean art, uh, cinema. We do a lot of uh, Caribbean film programs and culture. So we're known as curators, purveyors, and producers of authentic Caribbean experiences. Um, and why is that? It's because we're based in New York City, uh, one of the, I would say, one of the most significant Caribbean cities in the world. And uh, I believe the New York Times said that a couple of years ago as well. Um, so as I mentioned, we launched five years ago just with film. And since then, we've evolved to now produce arts and cultural programs. And we work with a lot of the leading institutions such as Tenement Museum. We do a lot of work with the Brooklyn Museum. We've done work with Queens, with Studio. Um, so we do work citywide. Um, and one of the things that we pride ourselves in is that we present contextual and culturally relevant programs. So this particular project is very contextual. So we, we brought the Tenement Museum to Flatbush to capture stories, and it's really, really culturally relevant to a, a current exhibition that's, that's happening as we speak. Um, and we, we celebrate the entire Caribbean experience and, as well as its diaspora. So we're not focused only on the English-speaking Caribbean. We also do Francophone programming, Spanish programming. We have not yet done anything um, Dutch Caribbean. Um, that's been a little more challenging for us because those populations aren't as big, as large in New York City. Um, but we've presented over 50 artists, filmmakers, and cultural groups cultural groups from 15 countries uh, around the world. Our signature programs include our heritage film series, which is taking place now, um, totally at the Brooklyn Museum, which was also known as the Flatbush Film Festival. We co-produce a, a summer pop-up series um, in the neighborhoods in Brooklyn, um, on street corners often. Um, it's called Flat Pop. We also have uh, just recently launched a limited edition line of merchandise. And then we also just recently introduced Carapolitan, which is a new concept that I'll go into in the next slide. Um, so back to that whole search for identity when you're first generation and you're sort of, especially when you're younger, um, now it's very clear to me who I am. So even if my dad or 
anyone says to me you're not Caribbean, then it's fine. Like I, it's whatever. But you know, there are a lot of people who still are trying to wrap their head around who they are and like what's their context and and how do they fit in to mainstream society, be it in. North America, in Europe, or wherever they reside in the diaspora. So we we came up with this concept. Um, so together with Natalia, who I work really closely with, where you know there are a lot of similar concepts like Afropolitan. There's Negropolitan, but we wanted to make one that was more culturally and geographically specific. So it's a hybrid of. Caribbean and polis, and so it, it kind of like merges those two identities because it's not quite the same living in New York and/or you know being from the region, right? Because you're really influenced by popular culture and just everything that happens in New York City. So you know that's how this whole concept came about. Um, and you could be first generation, second generation, one parent, um, or even you know a Caribbean person who migrated. To the United States is considered to be Caribbean because there's something that happens. There's like a transformation that certainly happens when you move to a metropolitan community like New York. So, you know, a lot of people ask like why uh, institutions are working with Caribbean again because we really, you know, we facilitate understanding who who Caribbean in a very authentic way, who Caribbean Americans are as immigrants. While sort of redefining what it means in 2015 and, and moving forward to be someone of Caribbean descent,、um, we also unify the Caribbean experience. So, you know, one of the things that we talked about a lot in this this video project that you'll see pieces of is you transcend you transcend nationality. So you're no longer Trinidadian, Jamaican, Haitian. You know, then you can all of a sudden identify with the entire region, and you become a Caribbean, a person of Caribbean descent or a Caribbean.、Um, and then we're also, you know, we, we do these types of programs where we connect,、uh, sort of, you know, people who engage with Caribbean people every day, because you can't live in New York and say that you've never encountered a Caribbean person,、uh, because it's just not. Possible,、um, so we 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 help to facilitate understanding about what Caribbean identity means and and culture and and that kind of thing, as well as we also we 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 do the same thing for our own community where we're we're bringing programming that makes them feel a lot a lot more connected to who they are, as as people of Caribbean descent.、Um, so some of the questions that we've been asking ourselves is how is Car- Caribbean culture defined in New York? What does it mean to be of Caribbean descent、um, in New York and the United States? How does residing in New York City、uh, enhance your sort of like norms, your practices?、Um, how are Caribbeans received in mainstream、um, the United States as well as back home? Because there's something that happens, or there's some assumptions that happens when you you travel back. Home, and then even some of the stereotypes. You know, one of the things that I remember from my father is being really, you know, t- this whole concept of like being a coconut head and a monkey chaser, and you know, or you know, a lot of people really distill the experience to Labor Day, which is one day. But you know, a lot of us we we live and we carry this identity and our our culture every day. Um, so even though a lot of us, like Jamani and myself, were made in Brooklyn, you know, we still are very, very authentically、uh, Caribbean. So I just want to share,、um, and I just want to also, I want to share a little piece from our our video project.、Um, we just shot it about a month a month ago, and、um, it's very rough.、Um, so please bear with us.、Um, it's it's still not finished, but we just wanted to to make sure that you guys had a, a chance to to really see what. Um, we've been working on, and, and we're hoping that this will be a multi-year project, and to take it to other cities and even back, back home to the Caribbean. But then, of course, when you're speaking with somebody from the Caribbean, you, there's a, a more of a connection, so it means something more. And even not just the Caribbean, like I, you know, because again, we're a diaspora. So when I meet people from, say, the continent, you know, you know, anywhere on the continent of Africa, 
again, it don't mean something. So first and foremost, just to reiterate the question, is that I identify I'm black, and black African American, Caribbean heritage, but at the end of the day, it's we're African and we have been dispersed amongst the world. So I love my Caribbean heritage, and I have uh, I have no problem calling myself a Caribbean American. But when it comes down to sense or something, I, I took black, and I've always identified uh, with the black American experience uh, for whatever reason. At the same time, um, as I embraced my Caribbean heritage, um, I, I wonder if that's the same way as a lot of my friends who are first generation. Uh, I speak to them; they kind of have a similar thing. And it just might be because many of us know our black American history a little bit more than we do the Caribbean history, which is uh, something we should probably try to correct, particularly as the next generation is coming. We want to make sure that you don't completely lose your identity. So it's something that I think about. But I do connect, and, I mean, in, in college, uh, I was a member of the Caribbean Student Union, uh, but I was uh, an executive member of the Black Student Union. My work uh, in the black community while I was still connected with Caribbean students. Uh, so there again, you know, I identified, I embraced, but when it was time for, for moving forward with the black community, uh, I really did a lot of work. Uh, being a child of immigrants is kind of an interesting um, limbo where I know I'm American technically. I, I do American customs and norms, but also I have that Caribbean background. So, for example, people will look at me and think I'm just black, and I'll eat fried chicken or you know cornbread or mac and cheese. But the thing is, my normal food is eating roti or curry chicken or rice and peas or those ashi salt fish and stuff like that. And so, there's always that weird dichotomy in my head of like which one am I? And there's also, you know, when it comes from my parents' perspectives, they don't see me as American, <laughs> per se. Uh, they, they'll say, they'll sometimes say things about Black Americans, and I'm like, hey, I'm American, I was born here. And they're like, you don't count. <laughs> You're a American. And I'm like, okay, but you know, other people don't see me as that, they'll just see me as Black American. So, so that weird, you know, double consciousness I have to do with all the time. It's really interesting being from Puerto Rico, I think, because we are citizens. However, we feel like immigrants. You know, we have an immigrant experience too. When you talk to Caribbean folks, it can be controversial. People are like, "Why aren't you just Caribbean? Why aren't you West Indian?" And the reality is, we are, and we're also in the Caribbean. And what that means is, we want to highlight the unique in the Caribbean elements of this pan-Caribbean culture that we're part of. A lot of us are Hindus, a lot of us celebrate you know, religious holidays or uh, eat roti and curry, which has become a part of this great Caribbean um, mosaic, this tapestry that we've built. But we also want to make sure that in this construct, we're not being marginalized, that our voices are at, as much at the table as everyone else. Well, I don't know if it's any different from, you know, within my area that is heavily Jewish or heavily Pakistani. Uh, the immigrant experience is one in which whenever you go outside of your homeland, you tend to gravitate to where your people happen to be. And for maybe the first 10 years or so, a generation, you tend to immerse yourself in that culture the development. After that, people start moving away. Immigrant Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so the first cut is about 30 minutes, but we don't have 30 minutes today, um, unfortunately. But that just gives you a little snapshot of of the project that we're working on and and what it means. And you heard Cherise talk about sort of like this. You know, I heard uh, Glissant. He talked about this cultural schizophrenia where you were. You know, you're Caribbean, but you're like American, and you know, it can get very confusing, especially when you're younger, um, depending on how grounded you are and connected or disconnected you are with your culture. So, um, you know, again, I just want to thank the Tenement Museum for putting together this event. Um, there is a panel, so I don't want to take up too much time. <laughs>
Um, and you know, thank you for, for your time and attention as well. Hi there. How are you all? Um, I'm Christina Greer. Dr. Christina Greer, as they say. Um, and I want to thank Laura for putting this together and Shelley for Caribbean and the museum. Um, I send my students here all the time, and I have to say this is my first time coming. It won't be my last. Um, and I'm fascinated because there's a lot of conversation about immigration, but I consider myself a JB. Does everyone here know what a JB is? Uh, just black, right? So when people say, well, where are you from? And I say, oh, you know, I was born in New York, raised in Illinois. And they're like, no, where are you from from, right? Many of you, I'm sure, have gotten the from from question. I'm like, uh, well, my parents are from Florida. My mom's from northern Florida. My dad's from Miami. It's like, no, I mean, where are they from from? And it's like, and so then you go through your lineage, and then you realize, you're just a JB, right? And so for those of you who've gone to college, for those of you who've been a part of the BSA and also the Afro-Caribbean Association, you realize there is a tension sometimes because uh, I'm 10th generation American, right? Uh, and so there's a migrant story that um, I'm very aware of. Um, and for those of you, I don't want to plug another museum, but for those of you who have been to the MoMA recently to see Jacob Lawrence's migration series, we know that there is this larger black American conversation that's going on uh, about the migration from the south to the north, and not necessarily just about the pull factor from the work, right? And so initially we conceptualized it as all these black Americans <coughs> wanted to leave the south to go up north to Chicago and Detroit and Pittsburgh and St. Louis for all these great jobs. But now we're also reimagining our own history to think of it more as a push factor from the south because of domestic terrorism and lynching, right? Um, so that's just another way that as we consider to, uh, to think about all of our histories and how they interconnect, um, history sometimes isn't always so far away, right? Um, and we can sort of change the narrative over these close generations. Uh, so that's where I am, and I, I really want to thank the museum for putting this together. So I always get the question first, why did I write this book, right? Um, and many people are oftentimes curious, well, who, did you find out who's smarter? That's not why I wrote the book, right? Um, who works harder? So, I'm always fascinated by that's the first set of questions that people always want to know um, when I tell them that I wrote a book about Afro-Caribbeans, black Americans, and Africans. Um, and so that's actually not the point. And so I'm very clear throughout the book, but especially in the beginning, which is my main focus of the book, is about coalition building and thinking about how we can really get substantive representation as black people in this country, because I don't know if many of you notice, uh, black people are still under attack in this country by a lot of forces. Um, when I say patriarchal and white supremacist sources, I sometimes get in trouble, but um, that's where we are right now. So anyone who's reading the news knows that um, there are a lot of conversations that are being had about uh, what does it mean to be black in the 21st century in this country. And so essentially, I always thought in my life that black people were interesting and dynamic. I just grew up in a household that said black people were interesting. Um, and so in graduate school, there's a lot of literature about, growing great literature about diverse Asian American communities and diverse Latino communities. But I knew, going to college especially, that there were black people from 54 countries in Africa and all over the Caribbean. So not everyone did eat, as someone said in that great video, cornbread and sort of the traditional foods. Not everyone's families had the same history as mine. And so why shouldn't I actually build on a literature that tries to discover that? Um, and where I build on sort of these great sociologists, Phil being one of them, Nancy Foner, Mary Waters, um, who've done this really great work about black, Amer black Americans and Caribbeans, I actually just thought it would be interesting to throw African populations in the mix as well because it's the 21st century and we know that African migration actually is happening. Uh, not at the same levels as Afro-Caribbean migration, but why shouldn't we take a snapshot so then in 30 years when we have large populations from Nigeria and Ghana and 52 other countries, we might want to say, oh, in 20... <laughs> 2008, we actually care to, 
to take an assessment. Um, and so it's really fascinated why the field of political science actually wasn't interested in these questions because we know that there's something about resources or the perception of scarce resources, political representation, right? Questions that sociologists sort of raise for us but don't necessarily answer in the same way as political scientists. So that is why I decided to go this route. I also um, started graduate school and my first love is cities, um, but I was told that cities were dead when I started graduate school. Uh, that was in 2001. So I don't know how cities can be dead, but I was told cities were dead, I'd never get a job. So I switched to race and ethnicity. Um, so thinking about um, identity, and I, I, as any time an academic says, they're not gonna talk too long, buckle up. But I am not gonna talk too long, because I actually do want us to have a panel and some really interesting Q&A, because that's actually where we get to the meat and bones of this thing. But thinking about my college experience, so I went to Tufts, um, for those of you who don't know Tufts, it's a small liberal arts college um, outside of Boston uh, in a town called Medford, Massachusetts, right? And so they have an opportunity for all black students, if you're interested, uh, which is somewhat complicated, um, if you're interested, you can go to Cape Cod the week before school begins your freshman year, right? Uh, and for someone like me who's never gone to school with people of color, I obviously wanted to go, right? Uh, and at the time, as part of Tufts' largest black class ever in the history of the school, 150 years, 60 black students out of 1,200. Um, so we went to the Cape uh, and the facilitator asked the question and he said, everyone close your eyes. Uh, and as we closed our eyes, he says, raise your hands if your parents told you when you get to Tufts, don't get messed up and you know, don't start hanging out with those black kids. It's an odd question because it's a room full of black people. Um, and I opened my eyes, obviously, and everyone's hands are raised except for my hand and the five other black Americans who are on the trip. Everyone else is of Caribbean or African descent. So that obviously starts off a fascinating conversation because it's the first time in my life that I'm actually in class with black people and I'm very excited. Um, but recognizing that their parents have told them certain things about black Americans and what it means to sort of downwardly assimilate with this group of people, right? Um, and so when we got back to campus, I was very active in the Pan-African Alliance, which most colleges call the Black Student Association, but we had changed that name to the Black Student Union, and that name got changed and changed and changed because it wasn't inclusive enough. So we settled on Pan-African Alliance by the time I got there. Um, and then the Caribbean students broke off and formed the Caribbean Student Association. And the African students broke off and formed the African Students Club, right? But they maintained membership in the Pan-African Alliance. So there was this duality of race and ethnicity, right? So there was something about being in Boston in this historically racist city, which I argue all cities are racist, but Boston gets a bad rap. But we're in this historically racist city. We're on this predominantly white campus where black students sort of uh, had very similar interactions where professors might assume that all of us were on financial aid or assume that all of us came from broken homes, right? But then there were some professors who would say, wow, you did so well on that test. Which parent of yours is Caribbean, <laughs> right? So making these assumptions about excellence and this jump to Caribbeanness, right? So which created a lot of tensions um, on campus and, and great duality conversations. Um, so when I decided to write this book, it, or the dissertation and ultimately the book, um, I came up with this concept as I interviewed people. I, I worked with uh, Local 371, which is a union here in New York, uh, and this idea of the American dream, right? And does America promise all immigrants the same sort of benefits, right? Does the polity provide equally? Um, and what a lot of my subjects told me, which is, well, if I came over at the same time as someone who's Korean, why is it that they have a different life circumstance or life chances than me as someone with phenotypically black skin, right? And there was something about, for the first time, we're seeing black immigrants sort of maintaining an immigrantness and not rushing towards assimilation and incorporation in the ways that we've seen white immigrants in the past. Because to be black and to be a black immigrant means that you're a black American. You don't get the same American status as other white immigrants have in the past. Um, and so as I thought about uh, this concept of linked fate, have you all heard of this? Uh, Michael Dawson, who's a political scientist, talks about linked fate, which goes beyond class. Um, and I wanted to actually see if it measured up for ethnicity. And he argues that whether you're wealthy or not, right, you feel some sort of connection to black people because a PhD does not protect me from certain things if I have black skin, 
right? So I may be treated just like the poor person down the street who's also black. So he found, measured it quantitatively, as political scientists like to do, um, he measured quantitatively that there is this very strong idea of linked faith between blacks, poor blacks, and wealthy blacks. I actually argue that there's a very strong linked faith between Afro-Caribbeans, Africans, and black Americans because of this shared phenotype. Um, and so what does that then mean for assimilation and integration when we also know that Caribbeans have a long line of integration into New York especially, not just the United States, but New York in particular, right? Um, and so we know that there are many Caribbean families that are fourth, generation, third generation, um, and not just first generation. So as I was talking to Shelley earlier, I consider myself a JB, but my grandmother who passed away way before I was born was from the Bahamas, right? So there is, I don't have a Caribbean link, but when I tell Caribbeans I'm a JB, almost every single Caribbean always tells me, you're not a JB, you're a Caribbean, right? You're one of us. It doesn't matter sort of your generational ties, right, um, and how close or how far away your ancestry goes. Um, and so as I wrote this book, and we can talk a lot more about it on the panel because I want to make sure I respect the city councilman's time, um, I wanted to really investigate what this, what blackness and black identity looks like in the 21st century, and more importantly, what does substantive versus descriptive representation look like? Right? So when black people are thinking about representation in electoral politics, this is where the political scientists differ from the sociologists, what does it then mean if, you're, if you have a black person who's a first generation and a black person who's a 10th generation, right? What are they actually looking for? Um, and so during the time that I was in graduate school, there was a fascinating race in Brooklyn that many of you may remember where Yvette Clark was running against uh, Chris Owens and David Yasky. Do you all remember that? Right, but the main, the political scientist in, in me, the main people, the three main, but it was a crowded race. Um, and so the main people, um, and so what was fascinating about that race and the discussion was that David Yasky sort of represented a particular demographic, right? Chris Owens, as the son of Major Owens, represented this historical black American demographic, right? But Yvette Clark, actually, when you talk to um, her at different events, she represented sort of this historically black district but it's also a historically Caribbean district. And so especially in Brooklyn, and now we're seeing in different parts, that there are these districts that are historically black and Caribbean. So what does it then mean for representation when you have something like someone like Eugene Matthews or Jumani Williams, right? And so does the district forever go in that direction or does it change, right? Um, and so I added in Africans in my analysis because I thought that would be fascinating. So if, for those of you who are from the Bronx, anyone from the Bronx? Yikes, we need Bronx representation. Um, so the Bronx is actually, has a growing African population, right? And for those of you who know Harlem at all, we know that 116th Street has a very large West African population as well. So what does that then mean for the future of representation um, for those immigrant populations? And also, what does that mean for scholarship as well? Uh, so there are a few things before we get to the panel. One, I think we're in a fascinating moment in this country um, when we have to sort of negotiate this duality of race and ethnicity, but there's certain things that happen to particular black people in this country where black immigrants actually do feel this racial cohesion and this racial identity. We do know that um, there is racial and ne uh, neighborhood segregation, as someone mentioned in the video, um, and so black people are sort of uh, put together, especially black immigrants are oftentimes put together either near or with black Americans, and it creates this perception of scarce resources which sometimes turns into competition, right? I always say perception of scarce resources because it's America, so there's no such thing as scarce resources, it's just whether or not they get allocated to particular country or particular populations, and it's important for us to remember that. Um, and so what does this mean for new leadership? What does this mean for Caribbean populations outside of New York as we see not just the diaspora evolve, but also suburbanization of populations, right? So if cities are no longer dead, we know that cities are no longer dead because wealthy white people now want cities again, right? So we're seeing black people writ large pushed out of cities. So what will that then mean for suburban areas and sort of these outer ring suburbs, first ring and second ring, and how will that change, right? How will blackness change? But also migration patterns, right? So historically Caribbeans have settled in major cities, but you know, we know that with African populations because of refugee statuses, right, they're being placed in different um, obscure parts of the country, right? So Somalians in Maine, 
right, and Sudanese people in Nashville. Um, and so some of these immigrants or migrants are being placed in places where they don't have any black people. So it's actually not really a problem, right, <laughs> because everyone's kind of fascinated and these are considered good blacks because they're not black American, right? And then some of them are placed in cities that actually already have black people. So that creates somewhat of a tension because you have the new blacks versus the old blacks, right, and stereotypes of both. Um, and so what happens, though, when cities evolve and we see sort of the dispersion of black groups and black bodies um, in places. And then for political representation, what does it also mean when people come from countries and they're not necessarily beholden to the, the Democratic Party, the big D Democratic Party? We see a lot more diversity with African populations, but one of the smartest questions I ever received was when I was um, an adjunct at uh, CUNY's uh, John Jay, and I had a Jamaican student raise her hand. She says, I know this might be a stupid question, that drives me crazy because A, it's usually not a stupid question, and B, oftentimes women apologize for really brilliant questions before they ask them. But she says, I know this might be a stupid question, but I'm from Jamaica, I just got here. Can you tell me why I'm supposed to be a Democrat? And I was like, ooh, ooh, how much time do you have? Like, that's a long story and it involves like FDR and a lot of really complicated things, right? Um, and so, but the, when we think about black migration and black immigration, there is this assumption of membership in the big D Democratic Party, but these are people who do not necessarily have the same limit, lineage with the civil rights movement um, in a much larger way. Uh, and so I'm fascinated by this great literature that Phil and his colleagues have put forth over the past few decades, but how do we then conceptualize this black Caribbean relationship now also that we have, uh, when we add Africans into the mix? And we understand 54 countries, it's not 54 cities, it's 54 countries and it's quite diverse, as is the Caribbean. But when we're thinking about this diasporic conversation, how do we then change this historical relationship that we're sort of evolving and still trying to figure out when we add in a whole new diverse set of people into that? So. I'll pause there, and then hopefully we can have a conversation about representation, changing neighborhoods, Brooklyn, since anyone who's from Brooklyn loves Brooklyn. Um, and then hopefully some Q&A before, I know, I'm like, Jesus, it's like, everyone from Brooklyn is from like the Brooklyn Tourism Board. Um, so, okay, so thank you very much. And if you, Councilman and Phil, if you all come up here. Hello? Okay, there we go. So did each of you want to just say a few words and then I'll sort of give some follow-up questions for both of you? Well, first of all, thanks a lot for coming. I, I, I'm very ambivalent because uh, I wrote uh, a book about Caribbean Americans. Now I just realized it's about a quarter of a century ago. And I'm, on the one hand, thrilled and honored to be on a panel with Christina and Jamani and Shelley, and I'm also feeling quite old. Um, because I'm realizing how historically specific what I wrote was. Fortunately, Ernest Skinner is here. Um, and uh, so some of us have memories that go back to a certain era when an awful lot of things uh, were just starting, uh, which have now really come to root. Uh, I guess I'd just make a couple of very fast observations. One is that, um, and I, I'm thinking of this partially because I'm at the Tenement Museum, um, very often when Americans talk about ethnic and racial difference, there's almost two different stories we tell. There's an immigration story, which the Tenement Museum is one of the great centers of telling, which often talks about a kind of a, a past that worked out by and large fairly well, that built the country in some ways, and then there's the issue, is the current migration living up to that or not? And how will the current migration be like that or not? And then there's a race story, and that's not nearly as happy a story in the way we normally tell it. Um, and that's been, you know, the original sin, really, of American life, and something that continues to come back and haunt that. Um, the notion that there are people who are in both categories, and that neither one really wipes out the other completely, that there are both immigrant ethnic elements and racial elements, and both are true, and it's not that one has to be uh, negated for the other, is something that's relatively hard for most Americans to get. 
In fact, when you hear many parts of the country, people talk about immigrants versus African Americans, as if the two couldn't be the same. Okay. Um, New York has always been different in that respect, because there's always been a substantial immigrant component to the black community here. Uh, New York, possibly Miami, is the other possible exception on that. Um, and it's one of the things that makes New York very distinct, is the fact that the, ra the immigration story doesn't um, end up uh, um, reflecting a racial division in quite the same way, that a substantial portion of the black population are immigrants and the children of immigrants, and frankly, that a substantial portion of the white population are the immigrants and the children of immigrants, which means that in some sense, this race story and this migration story cross-cut each other. And one of the interesting things I find in your work, to some degree, is the degree of resistance people have had to that idea. And the notion that, well, there's got to be something wrong in, in, in thinking about, you know, you have to be either thinking about your ethnic identity or your racial identity, and which is the really important one, when in fact, obviously, they're both interacting. Um, and I guess my other just observation is in the quarter of a century or so since I've written this book, um, the number of Caribbean elected officials has really uh, increased very markedly, many of them second generation. So on that, I will turn over to Jamani. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'm first generation, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Depends uh, on which direction. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm humbled to be on this panel. I'm not trying to figure out what role I'm going to play on the panel, because we have some brilliant minds who have done a lot of research on this issue, and I'm kind of just here and I got elected, but um, I, am, I am proud to be here. I want to give a shout out to my mom, Patricia Williams, who's here also. Um, Ernest is waving at you. Uh, it's, it's interesting to me, actually, I think this may be the first panel I've been on that's just focused on Caribbean. I'm usually on panels that are uh, about black American or African Americans, things of that nature. This is the first time I think I, I can remember that it's purely Caribbean, which is interesting for me. I never, uh, as I said on the, on the, the film, I'm, very, I'm super proud of my Caribbean heritage, but I've always identified with the black American experience and, and the African American experience. And I know someone said that their parents made sure to tell them they were Caribbean. I think my mother did the opposite a lot. She kind of said uh, I was black American. I mean, during the Labor Day, sorry to bring up Labor Day, Shelley, but believe me, I would have the biggest Grenadian flag that you could find on the Eastern Parkway, and my mother would laugh a little bit um, because, um, you know, she reminded me um, I'm black American, she's Grenadian. Um, but, but, but I'm very proud of uh, both my parents are from Grenada and have always been proud of that. And I think also part of my knowledge of Black American history also comes from my mom. They 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 made sure I understood the history of um, uh, black people in this country. So it's interesting to me that you know that I don't know what I think Shelley asked me the question. I really didn't know what to say because I identify with both. Um, but I kind of one have always felt the direction I was going in, in college that 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 friction was always there you know, between Caribbean Americans. Well, human beings like to divide themselves just in general, right? So, but, but we had the Caribbean American, um, Caribbean Students Union, we had the Black Students Union, we had the Pan-African Student Union, we had the Haitian American Student Union, but uh, we had, uh, there's Indo-West, so that was another West Indian, but uh, Caribbean. Then you had the Puerto Rican Alliance, the Dominican um, Students Union, and then you had the Dominican women. Uh, so it was like, it was a, a whole smorgasbord folks that I guess trying to find some identity in themselves. But this is, this is very interesting. Yeah, I represent an area that is heavily Caribbean. The politics is interesting in Brooklyn because you do have distinct populations that identify as black American, identify as uh, Caribbean American, and usually you can see it when it's time for election times. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of times people, people I, when I see um, black, I think of people who have a common experience in this country, and if they go other places, even in the world, people will see black skin and have a specific reaction to it. But I do know it's, it's different how people think about you, whether you're American black, whether you're African black, whether you're Haitian black, Francophone, uh, whether you're Caribbean Englo English speaking, whether you're Spanish speaking. So it's, it's very interesting to me. I'm happy to be here to be uh, part of the, the conversation of what it means uh, to be Caribbean. And, I do check black on the census. I don't, they don't, I don't think they have a Caribbean. There's been a push for Caribbean Americans to have that. 
I, w I would probably check both because uh, identify identifies both. Well, the census still has Negro on there, so <laughs> we're all checking that too. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting because uh, I forgot to say, like, the main finding of the book for political scientists, this was like, you know, earth shattering, but I found that race and ethnicity matter, right? Um, which, for, again, for political scientists, I mean, this, the book won an award on this finding. <laughs> and, and when I explained it to black people, they're like, okay, it's, <laughs> it's Wednesday, right? Like, what else do you have to say? Um, but I, you know, I, I, I always think about um, sort of blackness and immigration too. And um, for those of you who know about Walter Scott being shot on camera, right? Um, and thinking about the person who actually filmed Walter Scott being murdered on camera was an immigrant, right? And thinking about these inroads and possibilities for coalition buildings, because oftentimes we sort of get siloed with things that are important. But this is someone as an immigrant who sort of put his 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 status on the line, um, and really thinking about uh, what that means for future. I mean, I'm really into just like how can we actually work together, right? Um, and so. Thinking about past leaders, people like Stokely Carmichael and Harry Belafonte and people who are in the civil rights movement who identify as black, but they're also Caribbean as well, right? And so we, we have a long history of black Americans and Caribbeans working together for common goals. Um, so I guess I have a question for each of you. Um, so for Councilman, uh, do you, did you have and will you have a different strategy for organizing and mobilizing Caribbeans in your district um, and for you, Phil, um, is there anything that you wrote 25 years ago in this groundbreaking <laughs> foundational text that you would change today? Um, and don't, don't forget Malcolm X. And when okay. you put that list, and his mother was Grenadian, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, no bias, no bias. But it, I mean, it's interesting when I found, when I, I mean, some people think of the civil rights movement, they don't think of Harry Belafonte as Caribbean. They, they just don't, a lot of people don't know that Malcolm X had a Grenadian mother. I was very proud when I found out that uh, hip hop, uh, some of the people who found a hip hop were Caribbean, or the Cool Herc, Grandmaster Flash. That was very interesting. You know, Biggie. People, Biggie, yes, okay. Yeah, of course, Biggie. <laughs> but I said uh, the founders. Right. Okay. But, um, but all throughout, the, there's a lot of, there's huge Caribbean influence on hip hop. And so it's just interesting that we, most people don't think like that, and I don't think like that until I have to make a decision uh, of which one I am. But yes, you, I think you have to organize differently depending when you, where you are. I don't know that that's unique because I have um, a large uh, Jewish population, and so I have to think about how I identify or what can I use to identify with them when I'm there. I have a uh, large Caribbean population, so I have to figure out what to do when I'm um, speaking with them. Um, I think it's unfortunate that I think um, the black Caribbean and the Caribbean communities could coalesce a little bit better, um, but I think, you know, it's. Wherever you are, you have to find what connects. It's usually similar, what connects folks. But um, just saying that your parents are from the Caribbean or you have Caribbean lineage, lineage excites the Caribbean base. Um, so uh, if I'm not, if if I'm in a big Grenadian crowd, then you know I shout out I'm from Grenada. Uh, if I'm if I'm from a mix, you just shout out that you're from the West Indies and the Caribbean, and you you, you know throw a little accent and everybody gets excited and then um, you can you can do it that way uh, but so I think it's yes it's different but I think most places you go you have to find I mean you can go from one block to another block and they have something about that block that's different than the other block and you have to find out what that is to organize around them. Uh, yeah well actually before getting any question I just picking up on that I think one of the fascinating things about how diverse New York has become is that on the one hand, we see infinite possibilities of identity politics, but on the other hand, we see the limitations of identity politics because, you know, there's only so much you can do by saying, well, I represent these people because I want, we need people like me, we need my group in office. That's important, but on the same time, it leads to kind of an infinite regress, you know. Um, we need left-handed Dominican women in, po you know, you know, the, the, that everybody becomes a group. and. It's interesting in the conversations, we're talking about college and, you know, everyone who joins the club in college and this club secedes and that club secedes and the Indo-Caribbeans break off from the West India, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that that's very, very typical. But it also says something about what it is to be an 18 to 24-year-old. 
because identity is extraordinarily important in that age group for everybody, for all sorts of reasons, and actually extraordinarily malleable in that age group for all sorts of reasons. But when we move beyond that, it often ends up kind of being about interests. And I think one of the interesting things, and shared fate, and who has what in common. And one of the things I thought was fascinating in the, um, in the uh, film was someone saying, well, it depends on the situation or who's asking. You know, who I am isn't really an existential abstract question. It's, well, who's asking and for what purpose? Because we're all a lot of different things. And in a city like New York, that's becoming more and more evident because there were times when you have a place with one or two or three large racial groups who are constantly in contention, then who I am is very clear. You know, there's us and them. When you have so much ethnic identity in flux, who I am is, com because of the complexity, I think, ends up having to get involved in, well, there's interest group things, and there's things that people can be aligned with because they have certain reasons to want to do certain things and accomplish certain things. And I think we're kind of moving more and more in that direction as we become more diverse. I mean, ethnicity is obviously extremely important in this city. You could hardly exaggerate the importance of ethnicity in New York or electoral politics. And yet, at the same time, we're increasingly in an era when no one is going to be electable on the basis of one ethnic group. And when you are, almost immediately somebody else will subdivide that ethnic group in another way that's disadvantageous. So it's almost become essential that we have more substantive kind of coalition building. Um, as far as what I would say differently if I wrote Caribbean New York today, I don't think I'd have ended the book by predicting the demise of Marty Markowitz's political career quite that early. <laughs> I, I learned at that moment to avoid really falsifiable predictions, at least in the conclusion of a book. That's one thing I try to pass on to my students. Um, but I think the general observation that something was happening where it was going to become more acceptable to talk about Caribbean politics that was not in contradiction to African American empowerment, but was in some ways different and distinct from it, I think that that prediction I think pretty much holds up. I think you, you make a really fascinating point with who's asking. I oftentimes have my students um, list all of their identities, right? So just take 10 minutes and list every identity you have. And I teach at a predominantly Jesuit institution, but the vast majority of my students are not Catholic, right? Um, and it's amazing how religion comes up in ways that uh, I hadn't expected, but obviously gender, right? And I think a lot of it is the age group. Um, and then I ask them to rank the identities. And it's often, it's an impossible, difficult task, that's the whole point. Um, but it usually ends up being a conversation about uh, what has happened to them the day before right. dictates how they rank their identity, right? And so I explain to them, if I walk into a room where everyone uh, is from China, my first identity might be as a non-Chinese person. If I walk into a room where everyone is a male, then my primary identity in that moment is as as a non-male, right? Um, and so, Giovanni, you, you said sort of in passing um, the sort of black and blacks and Caribbeans in your district don't necessarily, you know, sort of have coalitions. What do you think um, they could do to sort of build better coalitions? Um, it's interesting. Uh, while you were saying that, I was just thinking about the other panels I've been on that are usually talking about uh, social justice issues, and I, I don't think in those panels that. I've ever necessarily identified myself as a, as a Caribbean American even. I just talk about um, black issues. And so um, usually if I'm in a Caribbean setting or someone asks, I'll bring it up. But otherwise, it's just interesting. I just always identify as black, African American, or, or what have you. But um, in my district, it's primarily Caribbean. And uh, when you go a little more north, it becomes um, a black American. I think people just in general like to blame things on other folks. So but that's, I mean, that's the, the crux of it. And it was interesting to hear, um, I've heard Caribbean people complain about black Americans. I've heard black Americans complain about um, Caribbean people. And the most interesting was uh, when I went to California and a friend of the family uh, was complaining about the Mexicans there, or the way that folks complain about black folk people here. So that was very interesting to me. But, but and I think it's about, um, the shared fate and um, the linking of the experiences. 
Um, there's a belief that one group or the other is benefiting more than the other. And I think that's unfortunate because I don't know. I mean, I think there is something to having someone who's elected that looks like you. Uh, but then that goes but so far. And I don't think that the elected officials who are either black American or Caribbean American have, you can point to say they did this one better or the other because they were either or. And so I think it's once you can figure out that this person can actually represent everybody and they were all kind of suffering is, is, is where it is. But it's easy to say that, but when you get on the granular level, the identity of politics uh, come into play quite often. Um, so, because I know, I don't even know what time it is, but I do know that we have limited time. Um, I do want to open it up for questions, because that's usually where the rubber hits the road. Um, so, should you come up with the, oh, can you come up and use the, the microphone? Okay, hello. Yes. Um, so I identify as Haitian American. Um, so this is a really interesting discussion for me. And one thing that I really, that really caught my attention was this discussion about coalition building, mainly because um, when I was younger, my, my father always spoke to me about Frederick Douglass and his relationship to Haiti um, and, and the history of that. And so uh, I, I always grew up knowing that there had been some sort of coalition, it seemed, between um, abolitionists and some Haitian leaders. Um, and even going throughout um, studying about uh, Nkrumah, for instance, 1959, you know, the, the beginning of Ghana, and uh, some of the black leaders that were in, involved in, in going to Ghana and, and, and uh, talking to, to those leaders about the ways that they could really build their nation. Um, and so I want to know, we have this history. What happened to it? What happened to it? What are the failures? Why is it that we have been unable to really recreate that? Because I, I agree that I see a lot of division and I'm unsure about why that, that's happening. Uh, so I'm always uh, careful not to have revisionist history, right? So sometimes it seems as though you know, we're all in Negro town and it wasn't that way. Um, you know, just a little shout out for Frederick Douglass. I mean, the work that he did in Belfast also is fascinating, um, sort of being here at the Tenet, Tenet Museum. Um, so yeah, we know that in Crewman, almost all of the black leaders of African liberation and independence movements went to HBCUs, right? I mean, in Crewman was at Lincoln. Um, and so like thinking about black institutions and education as a sort of one of the foundations of African liberation is, is fascinating. But I don't know if it was ever that rosy, right? I mean, if you read the Amsterdam News or the Baltimore Afro-American or like the Pittsburgh Bee and like the Chicago Defender, um, you know, there are a lot of conversations about like these Jamaicans and these Bahamians coming here on these migrant visas, taking jobs away from black folks, again, perception of scarce resources, right? And so there's that conversation about them um, in black papers, right? Because they could come and then leave. Um, and then you had employers who were saying, oh, I love when the Caribbeans come because they're so clean and they work so hard, right? And they're not like their lazy black American counterparts, right? And so making sure like, yes, there were coalitions. There are coalitions here today, um, but it may not have been as copacetic as the young generation. It's like, why can't we go back to like everybody, you know, together with our leather medallions that we had in the 80s, right? And it's, that's not necessarily the case. But why can't we sort of think about uh, maybe areas where we diverged, right? And so for me, I'm always trying to sort of look at the real problem. Like another poor person isn't the problem. Like it's structural, it's institutional. Why aren't there jobs? I mean, there's this great film with Stokely Carmichael interviewing his mother, right? I mean, that is just, it's brilliant when he says like, you know, why did you come here? Sort of, you know, why are we poor? You know, and she's like, oh, because your dad couldn't get a job. Why couldn't dad get a job? And she just doesn't want to say it, right? So it's always sort of her fault or her dad's fault uh, or the neighborhood's fault. And he's trying to get her to think about these historical structural inequalities that have persisted amongst black communities across the globe 
across the country and in the city, right? And so he keeps pushing her and pushing her. And it's so painful because she doesn't want to say it, right? And I think so much about identity and who we are and the circumstances in which we move in this country, um, for some people, it's really painful, actually. Um, there's a lot of triumph, but there's a lot of tribulations, right? There's a lot of tension because there are some people who feel like black immigrants in particular, you know, got all the benefits and none of the burdens. Now, that's not, it's not true necessarily, but there were some burdens that immigrants didn't actually go through in this country, but that doesn't mean that they didn't go through them in other larger colonial global forces that have, that explains the movement of black bodies across the globe, right? Um, so in that sense, it's like, yes, I think we can recognize that there was a moment where black leadership, black elite leadership actually did have this, this um, potential for coalition building. We may have weakened some of that, but that doesn't mean that like we don't have young people who are actually doing it, right? And it may not be called the same thing, and they may not be waving the banner of like, I'm building coalitions, right? But in the work that they're doing, I mean, you know, sort of fighting for uh, fair wages and affordable housing and good schools and sort of being a product of public school and sort of all these other things that sort of disproportionately affect people of color um, may be another way that we can look at these coalition possibilities. So, one. So, one, it's interesting when we talk about West Indian Caribbean, oftentimes. We're not talking about uh, Dominican Republic. We're not talking about the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, and too often we're not even we're not talking about Haiti. A lot of people they separate Haiti out, and Haitians have to organize themselves. But I think part of that is linguistic, and part of it is just um, our own prejudices against um, against certain Caribbean islands. I think we should we should be realistic about that as well. Um, so in my district, heavily Caribbean, I have an area that we call Little Haiti. It's like different than the parts that are uh, Caribbean. When we say Caribbean, we mean all the other islands um, besides Haiti, Dominican Republic. Like, it's crazy how we divide all those things up. I think the, the issue is, I think folks come together on easier on the big issue. If something happens to one that looks like us, we get to, this shouldn't happen. Man, we, we but, but then when the resources come to the bottom, it's about, well, who's getting it and why they're not getting it. I'm not getting it because they didn't. So I think it's more, the, the the larger the issue and the question, the more we've been able to coalesce a little easier. And this, when it comes down to the home of who's going to get what, the human in us starts dividing. And plus, we've been trained to kind of blame each other a little bit too. So some of that goes into it. But I think the more we can see that it's really just the same question, and uh, is, is what we have to get to, which is easier, much easier said than done. I think sometimes it's also easier, the more palpable the problem, the easier it is to organize. But if you if you can come out the, if, if they if this it's, just, it's so if it's so blatant, then it becomes easier. And so now we sometimes maybe it's not as blatant. It's just as damaging, and it's there just as much. But if it's not as blatant, then it gets easier to point and and blame the other person. It's, it's unfortunate. I think it happens in humans. I think. Blacks are less able, we don't have time to do that because of, um, like other communities, we're, we're dealing with so many other issues. Well, in, in the book, I actually look at policy positions just because I was curious if we could pinpoint where these various groups agree and disagree, then maybe we could move a little more quickly on substantive uh, representation and also policy mobilization. Um, and so obviously hindsight's 
so clear, but um, I asked a question about immigration and, and saw some statistical differences between black Americans, Africans, and uh, Afro-Caribbeans. Uh, what I didn't ask is when you think of immigration, who do you think of? Um, because for so many people, immigration means Mexico, right? But if you're asking black immigrants, for them, immigration may mean my mom, right? Um, and so there's, there's a difference in opinions on, on how much money and aid should be given to immigrants and, and various immigrant issues. Um, but I don't know with my black respondents if they're actually thinking about their own families or if they're thinking about sort of these other people who are immigrants. Issues with authority, you see where I get it from. <laughs> well, one of the, the things that I see is that we're coming from the Caribbean with these differences already. There is, when you're in the Caribbean, Trinidad and Jamaica are considered the big islands, and the other ones are relegated to the side. And we bring that to New York. And my cousin here is from Trinidad, and she'll tell you, whom I met here, that people from Trinidad. They just think they're a little bit better than the people from Grenada. So, <laughs> so we bring those issues here. And that's part of the problem that's here already. There's also the problem of a lot of the immigrants, some of them work two and three jobs, and they don't have time. They'll tell you they really don't have the time to get involved. And that's another problem. And then when they do make it, they move out to the island and they separate themselves. So that may be something the sociologists want to look at as part of the mix. Well, I think it's also um, not only do those perceptions about other islands travel, uh, perceptions about black Americans travel as well, right? So it's not like Caribbeans had never heard of black Americans before they got here, right? And so right. some of, or Africans, um, and vice versa, right? And so some of these stereotypes um, and assumptions actually travel quite quickly, um, indeed. Uh, it's, also, it's also interesting when you talk about immigration, how immigrant population views America. So a lot of people from the Caribbean don't, well, the, I guess the, I'm the first generation. So what's it, my mother's zero generation? What, what do you call that? That's the people mm -hmm. that actually came. But, but they, sometimes the immigrants, sometimes from the Caribbean don't see the importance of getting citizenship because they're going back home. My mother's been going back home for five years, for maybe 25, 30 years now. Mm -hmm. but it just doesn't hold. But other immigrant groups sometimes come, and they, they quickly want to get the citizenship. And so it's, a, it's a, a different mindset. I think that's very interesting there, too. Well, this is where the conversation gets really fascinating with African immigrants, because many of them uh, will not, they are not planning on going back home. The young people, the college age uh, Africans, are, are thinking about it. Um, but. Uh, Ruel Rogers talks about sort of this exit option, right? So Caribbeans, when, we're, when I measure the American dream, uh, many Caribbeans may have serious fundamental issues with the United States and they may say, well, I'm leaving. They may never leave, but at least they know that they can just hop back home. Whereas uh, I found that my African respondents were really hell-bent on making it work in the United States. And they were fully invested in the American dream because when I asked, well, do you ever plan on going home? And they're like, there's really no government structure to go home to. So I'm staying here and I'm going to make it work here, which is a different conceptualization of how you view your American status because um, if you know that you are here and this is going to be your permanent home, uh, when you see sort of negative ills that happen, uh, you process them in a different way than if you have this exit option sort of always in the back of your mind. Hi, sorry, I just wanted to say a couple things. Um, I, I do agree that the stereotypes often are coming from sort of, you know, just as the first generation, you know, sometimes you just hear those stories. It's like the black Americans are over here and you're sort of over here. So it happens in the household. Um, you know, I'm not, attributing any like right or you know sort of but that just how some of this stuff happens you know just like you know in the region itself you know you have those big islands small island sort of like you know or those people speak a different language or you know there are a lot of stereotypes around being Haitian American in the 80s and, and you know 90s 
you know, I remember growing up in, in Brooklyn, you know, yeah, of course, <laughs> why Clef Sean? And, you know, we talked about this, that very same question, because, you know, everyone that we interviewed in this particular piece, we asked them, do you plan to go back home? And almost everyone, or did you, was it your intention? Even if now they've assimilated and everything, but yes, I think in most cases, um, more than 50%, uh, there, there was that intention of going back home and, or, and or maintaining a connection because most people in the Caribbean, there's a really, you know, geographically we're much closer. It's not that expensive to travel from the United States to the Caribbean. So, you know, you can hop a plane for five, you know, under $1,000. So, you know, it's not like going to Africa, um, you know, in terms of being expensive. So, so there's just like, you know, this stronger, I think also geographical connection, um, with the United States, particularly New York, you know, Miami, as you mentioned, and some of the other sort of like Boston and, you know, other communities that have large community, um, Caribbean populations. So there's just, you know, this always idea like, if it doesn't work out here, then I'm just going to go back home. Um, so, so yeah, I just wanted to add that. And the other thing I wanted to add too is that, you know, this whole concept of being Caribbean or Caripolitan wasn't meant to be sort of divisive or to say that, I'm not black or, because I'm also half Indo-Caribbean too. Um, so a lot of people don't know that, but I, I am. So it's just really, you know, as Phil said, it's just like one slice of who I am. Like there are a lot, I'm from Brooklyn, you know, and that, that's another Brooklyn? thing. Right, <laughs> you know, and you know, there's so many things that I am, you know, I, I'm, you know, I talk about, you know, you know, now I'm, I run a nonprofit, but before I was a media executive. I mean, there's so many things that I am. So, you know, this is just one piece of that, um, you know, because identity has become so complex, right? You know, it's even, you know, now a lot of people are saying, like, you know, my hair is natural, and that's part of your identity, too, versus, you know, having locks or, you know, straight hair or whatever it is. But, you know, it's not at all, you know, I just wanted to, to say that because I know there's some conversations happening on Twitter about the whole Carapolitan concept. You know, it's really not meant to be divisive. It's really just like one of the things that we all are. Also, I think in the division conversations, it's important to remember that the framework of being black is bad is plays in play because it plays a part because you know, being African, you're, you're taught kind of here that it's bad. And so I remember Africans um, being bad. You said African booty scratcher. And then Haitians were like closer to Africans. So they were Haitian, um, Haitian booty scratcher. Like it was, it was bad. And so I think that, that thing about not being attached to Africa is part of some of the problem as well. I have a question. So I work here at the museum, and when we're talking with visitors, often the questions, the way that they'll separate immigrants is about status. So they'll want to talk about, you know, undocumented immigrants or documented immigrants, or maybe they won't have the language for it. But I know that a lot of the refugees, or a lot of the immigrants coming from Africa or from the islands uh, have refugee status. So I'm wondering, um, how does that refugee um, issue play into the, the kind of collective identity? Well, I, I think that you picked up on a really important point, because I think one of the biggest changes that we've seen in the last couple of decades has been the extent to which illegality has become sort of the new ultimate outgroup. You know, you can say things about illegal immigrants now that you can't say about any other group in the society. I mean, they're the easiest group in some ways to marginalize, uh, despite the fact that the legal changes are, you know, both, I think, the criminal justice system and the issue of documentation and citizenship have come to play a much larger role in kind of the way in which stratification operates in the United States today. You know, and you think about communities in which so many people are undocumented. Often immigrant communities often have lower voting rates anyway, uh, in part just because part because people aren't citizens, it's part because people aren't documented, it's part because the average age is a lot younger and there's a lot more people under 18. And of course, there are people in many parts of the country who are disenfranchised because of felony convictions. So for all of these reasons, citizenship has started to play this really large role in the United States and really become, in some ways, Michelle Alexander calls it the new Jim Crow. Um, I'm not 
sure I like that um, formulation 100% only because I think that that sort of makes it look like this is old wine in new bottles. This is the same old thing happening again. And the problem with that is at times it's important to look at how some things change. And I think that, you know, historically in the United States, citizenship used to not matter a whole lot. Um, African Americans were granted citizenship, you know, by the 14th Amendment, and it didn't keep them, it really didn't protect their rights in any substantial way. But today, citizenship seems to be playing, I think, an extremely important role there. Um, so I think just in terms of the um, logistics of, of the current migration, almost all Caribbean Americans are immigrants, not refugees. Um, that's a legal distinction, you know. All, and many years ago, there was the whole controversy with boat people, and there was any Cuban was automatically a refugee, you know, and any Haitian was automatically an immigrant, and therefore, if they were unauthorized, they were illegal. Um, clearly, you know, that has much more to do with American foreign policy than it's got to do with the actual circumstances under which people actually left. So I think that's an important distinction. Um, Africans are interestingly divided uh, because the African population, you know, we tend, and even thinking of it as one group is always very difficult. It includes extremely highly educated, often middle and upper middle class people who are voluntary immigrants and extremely impoverished refugees uh, who are coming under very, very different circumstances. Now, clearly, there's no way in Africa those people thought of themselves as being the same group. The question is, do they become the same group here? Because immigration is a process by which we change who we are. And one of the things I thought the Carapolitan video was extremely good at was it's not simply continuation of past identities. It's also how do those identities get transformed here when the circumstances are different. And the same things can have different meanings. And in different generations, these things may mean different things. And I think that's clearly happening with the African population right now. I think that, um, uh, one, because I have one of the, just something I was saying before, I have uh, the largest um, population of Haitians outside of Haiti. I think Florida too, but that's a that's a toss up. And so I always make sure to say that I'm so, I'm so proud because they anybody who's an American should be happy because they doubled the size of America, and everybody who's black should be proud because they were the first ones to free the slaves. Um, and I think just I wanted to say I think that is part of the reason that has always been a negative pushback on them because uh, I think of the great history that they have. Sometimes this might be a pur purposeful thing to try to not uh, acknowledge that history. But uh, to, to the question that was asked, I still think that we, it is much easier to blame somebody for the situation that you're in as opposed to um, the way that our system works. Everybody doesn't get parity. Everybody cannot succeed in the way that we say they can. So instead of attacking that, we have to attack somebody. So uh, we're either attacking Caribbean folks, we're attacking black Americans, now we're attacking uh, undocumented immigrants, even though none of those people are the reason why any one of those groups are where they are. And so, I, but I think it's harder to grasp that. And if you're angry, something's happening to you, then, then they took my job. I don't have that job because they took it, um, which is not the case. And, it's, uh, and that's one of the things that if we can get around, we'll organize so much better. But the system works better when we're blaming each other anyway. I mean, cause if, what if poor white folks joined us, it would be kind of crazy. Well, I mean, for those of you who haven't read uh, Jesse Jackson's 1979 interview in Playboy, Playboy does have really great articles. I'm just going <laughs> to put that out there. But he, this is right after King is assassinated. He's sort of looked at as the heir apparent. And he talks about how poor white people have sold their poverty status for this, like, false perception of a racial elitism, right? And it's like, and if, you know, the conversation is Martin Luther King wasn't murdered, you know, trying to organize black people. He was murdered trying to organize sanitation workers, right? So he's, he's murdered trying to organize poor people. And so what, what would that look like if poor whites from West Virginia who have zero agency actually teamed up with all these other people, right? And made it a, a class-based conversation, not necessarily race-based. But for those of you who have time, like I do, just to flip through the 1965 Immigration Act, I mean, the beautiful thing about what LBJ did, who's yeah. my favorite president, because he's constantly <laughs> just playing the Senate um, because he was 
a member and he knew how to do that, um, he essentially told them, oh, sign it, nobody's coming. Like, it basically is gonna affect like blacks and Asians. He's like, yeah, 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 like don't, don't even sweat it. Like, yes, it says that we can bring in all these blacks and Asians, but like, they don't have anybody here. So like, they're not gonna come. <laughs> okay, well, that's 50 years ago and he was obviously wrong and we think that he knew that he was gonna be wrong and that was his way of sort of um, changing an agenda. But I think also what I talk about in the book is you know, this concept of, the history of our country has always been about whiteness and non-whites and this protected white category, mm -hmm. right? But as we diversified, you know, to sort of protect your status, you had to bring in more whites, right? And so there are all these great books about how the Jews became whites and the Germans and the Irish and the Italian. Um, and so now I make the argument that this country actually isn't about whites versus non-whites, it's about blacks versus non-blacks. And all these people trying really, really hard to stay out of what they perceive as the last place category of blackness. Um, and how whites have sort of allowed new groups to kind of join them to protect their status, right? So blacks have already fallen from number two to number three as the group. Whites we know as a whole are very freaked out about sort of the rising Latino numbers, right? And so how is it that, you know, they're, they're now allowing in like Croatians and Russians and people that they never would have allowed in this group writ large because of this protective category. And so when we think about, as, as you've mentioned before, like this, this people constantly holding on and kind of always finding ways to divide themselves and sector themselves. What would it look like if we conceptualize coalitions in other ways beyond race and ethnicity, um, maybe thinking more about class, but this country actually has never had a class conversation um, in, a, in a real substantive manner. Let's end on a positive note though. Right. Um, Does anyone have a positive question? Well, I'm sorry, I have to head out, so I just wanted to say uh, thank you very much. Um, I also, um, you mentioned the, the FAIR Act, it's actually uh, the FAIR Chance Act that we passed in the City Council, which uh, is exciting because it changes the question um, of when you can ask about a criminal history. You can no longer ask it at the beginning, you have to ask it after you've offered the applicant a job, giving them a conditional job offer. So uh, we're very excited about that in the city council. So thank you so much and thank you for being on this panel. That's a positive note. That's a, great, right. that's a really positive note. Thank you. You all, I just want to say good night to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jumani, Phil, Christina. Thank you, Shelly, Caribbean. Um, thank you all for being part of this conversation. And I hope you all come back to the museum. So. Yeah.